Good morning, church family. For uh, those who are joining us online, we are glad you're choosing to be with us today on this cold, snowy winter morning here in the Panhandle. But for those who chose to come out this morning, we are grateful that you are here sitting in this room. Uh, we have some people who may be coming from other congregations, so we want to say we're, we're glad you're here. This place is always welcome. We hope we can encourage you as next week you head back to your congregations. Um, we are in the middle of our Christmas series, Shepherd of the World. Um, and I wonder if, as you've ever read through um, the Christmas story, to, to consider that there were a couple of options of things that could have happened in the field that night. I, I don't know about you, but uh, as a kid growing up in South Irving, we would often play games at late night. Like sometimes, you know, here I am as an 8, 19 year old, and it wouldn't happen today necessarily. But uh, we'd be playing games, and it would be 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Summertime, we might go till 1 o'clock. And we were playing in, in dark places. The darker, the better. So we're in people's backyards. We're in, in boats. We're on top of roofs. We are under cars. The only thing you couldn't do was, was go into a person's house. Um, and it was like, the darker, the better. But every once in a while, there's that moment where you think you've got this really dark, perfect place, and no one's going to find you in this game of hide-and-seek. And all of a sudden... The people who live in the house hear you messing in their bushes, and they flip all the flood, floodlights on. And, and two things happen. One, you think, I've been caught, <laughs> right? You're hoping there's no ch 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 shotgun sound. Number two, now you're blinded because you were looking, and all of a sudden, in the darkness, your eyes had adjusted, and the lights come on, and you flip out, you start fumbling over everything. You run into walls, you trip over logs, you're laying in the, in the flower bed trying to get out, and you're tearing up the flowers. So those moments of panic when all of a sudden things change. And for the, the shepherds, that's exactly where they were. When the angels appeared and this massive light shone out, the first thing the angel says is fear not, right? Because he understands the human condition and he knows we are going to freak out in that moment. Now what I love is that once he's spoken peace into the moment, then he begins to share this incredible story. Now last week what we said was, much like the shepherds, we long to hear the voice of God. And I prayed this past week that you were engaged in our scripture readings, listening to the voice of God. And there may have been some, some pruning and correction there that, that we've kind of gotten away from that. We're not familiar with his voice. For some of us, there was a time of celebration to, to take on a common reading plan with the entire congregation, and, and you heard that voice as a corporate thing. And then for some of us, there was just those moments that we've added into our readings that we just can't seem to get enough. And I love that, that in this story, what we see is the shepherds just froze for a moment, but they were given an incredible word. Our Savior is come. We're going to take that and we're going to build upon it because I think um, it would have been a sad day if, if nothing had happened in response. I mean, you go back to D-Day, and if, if, you know, the 501st had jumped into behind enemy lines into France and preparing for D-Day, but what if they had landed in the area behind Normandy into the, to the intercoastal area of France and just stopped and stayed, right? How sad would it have been if they had, had reached their points, they landed to the ground, they took off their stuff, they had all their things, they did the inventory, they gathered all their men together, and they just sat and said, okay, we did it. <laughs> we made it, right? We've, we reached our point. That wasn't the objective. The objective was to hit the ground, gather together, and then fight from behind to open causeways into the area where the, the guys who were storming the beaches of Normandy from all countries who were on the Allied side would find a place where there would be peace and they could get a, an inroad into France and begin the invasion. But how sad would it have been if they had never taken a step and had not finished that objective? They just landed and said, okay, we've made it. Pat our backs. Let's gather up. Let's sing some, some songs and let's celebrate. Let's go find a pub. Let's go find a canteen. Let's go find a place we can light a fire and let's just celebrate. And I believe if we're not careful when it comes to the Christmas season, we forget that hearing the word of God, hearing the voice of God, then requires something else. Now the question is, what is that requirement? If you have your scriptures, I want to invite you to open up to Luke chapter 2, and we're looking specifically at verses 15 and 16 this morning as we break down this narrative of the shepherds. Remember last week, right, the angels came, shepherds are tending their sheep, and, and he gives them a word. There is a Savior who has been born. 
Now they went from fear to awe to captivation. And, and the angel sharing this, this word with them. But he says, look, here's the thing. There'll be a manger and there'll be a baby wrapped in these clothes and he'll be lying in this manger and there'll be a mom and dad. And, and, and all the signs will show you that this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. This is the Savior that's been born for the entire world. And in speaking that word, then there's a response. So let's read this together. It says, when the angels went away, after the message was shared, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. So they hear the word. They hear the voice of God. And again, I don't know how familiar these particular shepherds were with the voice of God. I think that based on Jewish customs, they would have at least memorized the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. They would have known that word for word. Those stories would have been shared at the dinner table, would have been shared at celebrations, at the different festivals and feasts, the festival of tents, the day of, uh, of atonement, Yom Kippur, the day of the Passover. All these stories would have been shared, so they would have been very familiar with those things. But as far as hearing the voice of God directly, I don't know that they were very familiar with it. But here's the key. When they do, something happens. And in verse 16, we see this. And it says, when they heard this, their response was, let us go to Bethlehem. And for us, we have to understand is that when we hear the voice of God to simply stay where we are is disobedience, that we must go see him. That is the directive. Now, I'm going to use that phrase to describe simply doing something very simple, but very profound. King Saul has been given a command in the Old Testament. It's one of the final places where he'll have a, a big action victory. And the command was, go into the city and conquer these people. Consecrate everything to me. And what happens is, is that as they go in, they're victorious, but there are people who are bringing things out of this conquered city. They're bringing animals, they're bringing goods. And so Saul begins to kind of freak out because he knows what the command was. He knows he should be obedient, but rather than enforce the obedience of the word of God and the command that was given, he decides we're going to give a big offering to God. And so he starts to gather all the people together, and they're going to have this great worship time, and he is going to, to institute this time of offering. And Samuel has been given a word from God to go because there's disobedience that's taking place within the kingdom. And as Samuel walks up as the prophet of God, he begins to hear the bay of sheep. And he, he walks up to Saul, and Saul's like, yeah, we had a great victory. He says, well, describe to me. And he tells him all the great victorious things that happened and how they were about to do this big offering because God had been so faithful and gracious to them. And then Samuel asks the question, if that's the case then, why do I hear sheep? Well, we had to, we had to gather them. We're going to do this offering. And there was a profound statement that, that Samuel makes that we all should heed, that God prefers obedience over sacrifice. And so this phrase that we will look at today that says, let us go see him, doesn't always mean that we have to go someplace. It just means when God's voice has been given to us and there's a revelation, there is a required response. And so today I want to encourage you that we need to respond to God. Like the shepherds did, we need to live a life of responsiveness. We need to live responsively. Now, I know that if you're like me, my dad grew up in the panhandle, and there's an ethic here that you are responsible for the things that you are given the task to do. When he was a little kid living in Corsicana, he was responsible to sweep the floor in their house, but the floor was made out of dirt. <laughs> so it's the never-ending task, right? But he was taught that if he didn't do that responsibility, there would be consequences. And as a kid, he sometimes didn't do it. And as that father left and, and they had a stepfather come in, he taught them when they come to the table, there's a certain way we behave. And if you can't behave that way, there'll be consequences. And so they lived responsibly to their stepfather because he had a massive middle finger and he would flip them on top of the head if they didn't pay attention to behave. There's a work ethic here that says we must be responsible, but I don't want you to get that confused with what we're saying today. I'm not asking you to live responsibly. I'm asking you to live responsively, that when God has revealed himself, there is a reaction. Now, there will come a point in time in our world 
when that reaction is going to be fear because the worst possible thing that could happen has happened, that they thought wrong. And they will realize in the end times when the king comes back that they are separated forever. But for us as his children, we will respond with joy because when the king comes back, we will be, yes, it finally came true. I was so ready for this. This is going to be a good thing. And so living responsibly requires us to do a couple of things. First of all, we must make sure that we are hearing from him. That is the purpose of driving us back into Scripture. That is the purpose of getting together and, and praying and singing praises and joining in fellowship is that we crave to not just feel good about ourselves. I know it can be easy for us who have gathered here, the fellowship and the frozen, <laughs> and say, I'm, I'm one of the elite worshipers. Do I get my, my star? <clears throat> can I get a, another cup that has a little logo on it? Do I, do I get some? If we're not careful, that's kind of how we think. But here's the thing, is that whether we're here in the building or at home, we respond to the fact that God has called us together. When we hear his word, which we eagerly desire to do, then it requires that we obey him. And this is the most dangerous aspect of our faith. That many times we hear, but we choose not to obey. How sad would it have been if in the context of what the shepherds did, that they acted probably like we would in the flesh. I just heard a word from God. I just saw the angels. I just have been given an information that's going to change the world. Good news for all people. Let's build a church. Let's build a statue. This is called the moment of revelation. We're going to build a statue here, and we're going to stay here. In fact, we're going to build villages here because this is the only place. I had never heard God's voice before, and so when I, when I came here, this is where I heard it. So we're always going to graze here. And as soon as I can build my house, I'm going to build my house here because this is the sacred place. And I'm always going to come back to this. And, and maybe if I can't build the house or build the city, I'm going to come back here every year at the same time so I can hear the voice of God again. Do you see what I'm getting at? That oftentimes when God reveals himself, our response is to stay. Is to not respond, but to do nothing. To think that the most sacred thing we could do is to hold up in this particular spot and never leave it because we will never hear from God unless we're in this place. That is, in my opinion, the dangerous detriment of the American church. that I can't worship God unless I'm sitting in these particular seats or wherever you worship at. If you have pews or chairs or if you sit on the floor in Africa, they sit under trees sometimes. When I was there a couple years ago, that's how we did the church plant there is that we did a worship service under the tree. And you think that I can only worship in that place. But worship isn't conditional to the location or address. It's conditional to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What did he say to the woman at the well? Now is the time where you worship here and the Jews worship here, but there will come a moment when you will realize that my Father who worships in spirit loves the spiritual worshipers, and it would be worship everywhere. We don't live in the temple age. We have to go to the temple. We can't approach him personally, and we have to wait for the high priest who's a human being to intervene for us. We have Jesus Christ as a high priest, and he sits at the right hand of God, and he intervenes for us every day. And so when we hear from God, there is a directive to follow through with obedience. Now, if he says stay, then stay. <laughs> if he says build an altar, build an altar. If he says build a city, build a city. But I know this, in Matthew 28, what did he tell the disciples? Go. And I love the fact that in this story, the shepherds did not stay. They said, let us go see him. There's a conversation that Jesus has with a woman in Luke chapter 11. And he's, he's, he's telling stories, right? He's been teaching and preaching and, and giving this great wisdom. And this woman stands up and it's very uncommon in first century. And so when she stands up, she makes a statement. And this is what she says to Jesus. She said, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. 
So she hears the teachings of Jesus. I don't know if she confesses him as, as the Christ or the Messiah, but she makes the statement, look, your mom must be really, really proud of you. And she must be incredibly blessed because she gave birth to you. And that's kind of an egotistical statement, right? Can you see Mary? <laughs> I, I did this. Right? He, he feeds the 5,000. Excuse me. That came from here. I, that's me. Th there's a running joke that I have with some of my close friends that when they have their birthdays, I want to high-five their mom for giving birth to them. Right? A little celebration. You did a good job there. She wants to celebrate Mary. But listen to Jesus' response. Matthew, or I'm sorry, Luke 11, verse uh, 28. But Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Why is that significant for us today? Because it isn't who you give birth to that brings you blessing. But the blessing from Mary came that when God said, you who are highly favored and chosen, and she said, do with me as you will. She heard the word of God and she obeyed it and Jesus came. Joseph heard the word of God, contemplated whether he was going to you know, in, inflict punishment on her and, and, and divorce her and leave her. He could actually kill her, but he responds when the word's given to him that this is from God, and he marries his wife. Zechariah wasn't quite as, as quick. You know, Zechariah's in the temple, right? John the Baptist's dad. And he hears this prophecy and he says to God, how can it be? I am an old man and, and my wife is of upper age. And, and God says, well, since you won't believe me, I'm going to take your voice from you until your son is born. And he has no more voice for the next nine months. But because of that, he realized God had revealed something to him and his obedience was to nurture that to speak into it. His wife did the same thing. She celebrated. She gave birth. There's all these moments. It's not because they were in the storyline, but it's simply because they obeyed. And for us, we don't want to get caught in the situation that when we hear the voice of God, that we stop and stay. I've told the story before, and I want to share this with you again. That there was a monumental moment for me. I, I, my salvation is, is, is an incredible story for me. It's not dynamic in, in, in as far as the details, but for me it was life. Call to ministry. But there was a moment when I'm sitting in Central Park on a mission trip with high school students who are on a choir activity. And every day we're going and doing some benevolence activities, then we're singing um, this program in the afternoon. And so in the morning I would get up like at 6 in the morning, a couple hours before we had to be up and out, and I would go to Central Park five blocks away, and I'd break up my Bible, and I would have quiet time. And I just thought, that'd be a really cool place to have quiet time, right? Central Park, I've never been there before. And so as I, as I find a rock right off the road, that were, the street that we were in, that went into the park, I went up to that rock, and I sat down, and I looked around me, and there's probably five or ten homeless people who are cuddled up in the little nooks there between the rocks, and, and they're snoring. So this great cacophony is happening, and God reveals something to me. And it's a temptation for me to want to go back to that rock and hear that voice again. But praise God, I don't have to. I just get to step into his presence. I dive into his word. I sing his praises. I gather with his people. I spend time in prayer and meditation. And he reveals himself to me. And the key is, we must obey. But I want you to listen to what the, the shepherd said in verse 16. It says, when they respond, what did they do? They went with haste. The definition of this word is ex excessive speed or urgency of movement or action to be in a hurry, to go in a hurry. They didn't sit there and contemplate. They didn't weigh what's the benefit and what's the cause, what's going to happen to our sheep. I don't know if they even took their sheep with them. The sheep become non-existent in the story. But all we know is, is that they immediately, from hearing God's word, they obeyed and they went to find For us to respond to God, I want to encourage you in this, this Christmas season. As you spend time with your family, as you give gifts, and as you sing songs, and you decorate your house, and, and you have all the traditions you have, don't forget that when you hear the word of God, our Savior has come, that you respond in haste, with energy, and activity, and purposefulness, and intensity. And again, if he says stay, then I want to hurry and be hasty, and I want to stay right now. If he tells me to go, I need to get my shoes laced up ASAP. I need to pump my kicks and get out the door because it's time. 
Do not contemplate. Don't weigh. Don't try to bargain. Don't try to finance. Just respond. And I think the blessing for us in this season is to remember that we are called to live responsibly. That's what we see in the story of the shepherds. Unfortunately, I believe that we sometimes stay. Sometimes we don't respond appropriately. We try to build things that are expressive of our gratitude on our own accord, and we forget. How do I know this is true? There are thousands of people in the city who have decorated their houses, who will give gifts, who will sing songs and share food, and never consider the reason. They decorate their houses because it looks good. They share the food they share because it tastes good. They, they have these parties because they get stuff and it makes them feel good. But we never consider, is there a spiritual significance to the things that we are doing? And if I'm living responsibly, I, ref, I see how God is redeeming all of these things in our culture to bring attention to Jesus Christ, who is the shepherd of the world, who came to reveal his father and draw the sheep to the father. Not every sheep who hears his voice will respond in obedience. But praise God that his children have. The good news came. Jesus Christ, our Savior, has come. The good news we celebrate this morning is that we have a call to seek after our Savior. He can be found. He is not hidden. He has not removed himself. He is not keeping himself. You don't have to go through seven different steps and different levels and committing yourself and pay a certain amount and, and pray a certain way and hold your hands and be sitting and, and sing the songs just right. Praise God for that because if that were the case with our stuff this morning, we wouldn't be able to praise God. But all I know is this, is that since he has come, we are called to seek after him, and that means that he can be found. The shepherds went away, and they found the manger. They found the stable. They found the family sitting there, and they found the baby. And they shared with Mary what they had heard. And you know what happened? Mary took these things that she heard and treasured them in their heart. Because she also knew there would come a day that in obedience, Jesus Christ would allow himself to be captured and put on a cross. He had the conversation in the garden. Father, if there's any other way, let it pass from me. And God reveals and affirms, this is the way. And without further concern, Jesus walks out of the prayer time. He's arrested. He's taken into trial. He's falsely accused. He's beaten. He's humiliated. He's then put on a cross. He then dies. He's then laid in the tomb. He lays for three days. He arises and defeats death. He walks for 40 days, and he ascends to heaven. He did those things because he was revealing. Your father loves you, and he wants you to live in a relationship with him. And for those of us who have heard that story, we responded. And I want you to take this Christmas story and share it. Go seek after him. This past week, there was a great ministry moment. And some of you know about this, and some of you have not heard. But we have families in our community who are hungry. Hungry for relationships, hungry for a place to call home, and that they are physically hungry. Jaira, with Jason's leadership, has been feeding, back in January, February, we were feeding about 70 families per week through Jaira Ministries. And then when we move into the pandemic season this past month, we've seen a weekly attendance of about 260 families. Our highest we've had has been 280 families. Some of those families have seven people, some have nine, some have one. And so each year, in coordination with Jaira, the Ministerial Alliance, the Parenting Christian Church Alliance is how it's known now, gets together and we work with United Foods, Jaira, the Corson Family Endowment, and this year we worked with Seaboard Foods, and we fed over 300 families on Friday. Over 300 families will go home and, and have a food to put on the table to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. But hopefully what they saw as they drove through and they received their bags of food and they heard from people 
as we said, Merry Christmas and Feliz Navidad and, and Buon Natale, whatever language we could think of. This, this, I don't know Japanese for Merry Christmas, but we're just trying to, to do something. But what they saw was that there truly is a God who cares about his people. And my family was hungry, and there was a community of people who are willing to feed us. You see, Savior came. And I want to encourage you in this Christmas season to seek after him hastily. Don't wait. Go. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that, first of all, that you revealed yourself through Jesus Christ as he came into the world as a baby. Father, thank you for the story of the shepherds. And, and as they heard you, they responded with, let's go. They had a conversation with themselves to make sure that what they heard was accurate, Father. But then they responded to your word, and they went and they found the family. They shared what you had given them, what you had told to them. And Father, that was something that Mary needed to hear. And I pray that we as your people, as your children, that we would follow that same response, that we would go and see him. That we would leave this place and we would search for where Jesus is moving. If the Holy Spirit is moving in our neighborhoods and he's moving in our homes and he's moving in our businesses and our relationships and in our churches, that we would go seek after him. And that, Father, in that, we know that you will do some amazing things. Let us not be complacent in being disobedient. Let us not stop. We've heard that, that word, that revelation from you to try to build something in honor of that, to try to evoke a response out of you, but let us respond. And sometimes that response is to stay. You said that to the, to the 3,000 who heard your word. You said, stay. Jesus told the disciples to stay. But then they were sent. And so, Father, I pray that this Christmas season that we would be encouraged to go and seek after your son. And may we find more and more people seeking that same thing. May we find joy in the fact that Jesus can and will be found. Father, you reveal in Revelations that Jesus says to the world, Behold, I'm at the door waiting. And we know that he is not hiding himself. He's just waiting for us to open the door and look. And so, Father, I pray that our, our city would be moved by the Spirit to seek after you. And we thank you for this part of the story of, of the shepherds that it inspires us in this Christmas season, that you truly are your son, is the shepherd of the world. We pray these things gratefully in Jesus' name. Well, good morning, everyone who's been watching online, worshiping online in their cozy pajamas, maybe drinking hot cocoa. Let's just continue this time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just this technology that we can worship just from around Perryton and around just really the world, Lord. Lord, we thank you that in the coming weeks, Baby Jesus will be born in this manger and um, this joy of the world will enter in as we anticipate the birth of Jesus. We're always looking forward to the cross where this joy is complete and we can respond to you, respond by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Lord, during this time and this Christmas time, Lord, I, I pray for everyone to just respond to you, listen to what you are saying to our lives and pushing us out into the world to go and tell people about the good news. Lord, in, in Matthew, it's a great commission, not a great omission. And we are commissioned to go and respond to you. And if, if God is calling us to go somewhere, let us go with haste. And if God is telling us to stay in this place, let us wait and anticipate. Lord, I pray for those who need to hear this good message. Maybe it's one of your friends or a family member or a coworker, Lord, that you will put people in their lives, that we, we are used to go tell people the good news. Just as the shepherds were excited to go, they left immediately. They didn't sit there and contemplate, oh, should we go now or later? They went to go see baby Jesus, Lord. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of quick announcements before we sign off this morning. Christmas light adventure christmas hayride that is on december 19th this coming saturday at 5 30 p.m it's gonna be awesome cookie 
decorating, ornament decorating. There'll be carols. You can go on the hayride to see all the lights. Lights look awesome this year. And then December 20th, Family Candlelight Worship Service. That's next Sunday, December 20th. And then Family Christmas Eve at Home, December 24th. You can sign up to get Christmas package. Just go to the church website. You can email us there. Lunch Bunch Christmas meal today is the pickup, December 13th. After service at noon, pick up following today. We can deliver. If you have any questions with that, you can contact Pastor Shirley. And then, again, we said Christmas Eve worship, family worship. This is where you worship at home. Sign up in the foyer of the church, or you can email. Packets will be ready for pickup on the 20th, December 20th. Um, tomorrow, right? Tomorrow is Connect Women's Gathering, Regifting Christmas Gathering tomorrow at 6.15 p.m. in the Impact area. You can contact uh, Shannon Waterbury for more information. You can also look on their Facebook page. Also, this Wednesday, this Wednesday for student ministry and, and children's ministry, we're having our Christmas parties for the students. We're going to wear your ugly sweaters, bring a $5 white elephant gift exchange, and also for the children, they're going to play some awesome and fun games. If you noticed a Christmas tree in the, in the lobby, you guys didn't. But if you want to contribute to this, uh, you can contact the church office. This is the Perryton Christian Church Alliance Christmas food contribution. You can send in money, $35. Just $35 helps provide a Christmas meal for a family in the Perryton area. You can come to the church office to get an envelope, or you can contact the church uh, through email, and that email is on our website. Have a blessed week. Go into the community. Go share the good news. Go with haste. Have an awesome week.